So this lecture is a bit of a different style. I want to show you something about uh, the SAGE computer algebra system. And up front, uh, SAGE is a great system that I've been using for many years, but I'm not a developer. I can help you get it installed, I can help you use it, uh, but none of the credit should go to me. It really goes to the folks behind um, SAGEMath.org. So let me show you what you get there. So this is the starting or well, the landing page when you, when you go there. And for most operating system, well, I would recommend you install it natively. However, it does require some space. So I'm running it on my Linux computer. And uh, if you have, say, Ubuntu or Debian, you can actually install it uh, through packages. There are also Windows and Mac OS installs. Um, if you prefer using it um, online, so as a one-off thing, um, you can go for the left part here, which says CoCalc Instance Sage Worksheet. Um, that is a little bit too massive if you just want to do a quick calculation, but it has a nice feature of giving you a somewhat longer lasting um, interface. I will show you briefly how the Sage Math cell works, because that is um, a quick way of, of using Sage. I realize that the font is not easy to read, and because of that I've actually been switching to some other thing for the rest of the demo, but just to show you some things, I can now type 3 plus 4, and well, we all know it's 7, and I can add some more lines and whatever, and then I ask the Sage to evaluate this. So I have to click on the evaluate thing here, um, and things a little bit, that's mostly because it's now sending off a call to the backend computer, and all right. So now it has figured out that the result is 7. Most of this wait time was because Sage was waiting for um, the backend to wake up and say, hey, well, some user has been asking me a question. Because I realized that the 3 plus 4 and the 7 are barely readable, um, I'm actually now going to show you um, the same thing on Linux computers. So this is uh, through the command line interface. If I now type 3 plus 4 and push return, then well, it also gives you 7 and I hope you can actually read the 7 in the screen. Now, my terminal is a bit wider, so some part is going to be cut off on the right. Apologies for that in advance. It's not going to be much important information. Um, but yeah, so it's, it will be visible. Now, Sage is written by mathematicians, and so you might find Sage a little bit nitpicky. So for things like 7 or so, it carries around where that thing lives. So it has an idea that 7 is an integer. So if you ask it, where does the last result live? So first of all, last result is just underscore. And then, well, you get that back. If you want to know where something lives, say, let's say the result is the last result. So now we call this R. And once you've given it a variable, you also have access to a whole bunch of functions that come with this variable. So you can type R dot. And then in the command line, you have the possibility to type tab. This is certainly something I've been using a lot when learning Sage, and I still use because it saves me some typing. Uh, but it's also a little bit long. Now, in this case, it's a very long list that you can do on integer. For instance, if you want to see what the bits um, of R are, then that's a nice one to use. Um, Sage is built on Python, and um, well, you're calling a function here, and a function expects arguments. So it expects that there is something in the parentheses. Now, you don't actually want to give it any argument, but you still have to give it an empty parentheses, else it will complain. So I can show you first what it does without that. It will tell you what this method is. Now, you were not actually curious about what the method does to the integer object. You want to know what the bits of R are. And so you're putting the open close parentheses there. And then it will tell you, that if you look at the bit representation of 7, it's, well, 2 to the 3, uh, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 1, plus 2 to the 0. You can also ask it for the digits of it in some other bases. So if you type digits and it completes, um, default is 10. If you want to have the base 2 representation, and you also can get those bits. It also gives you this. But should you want to have the base 3 representation? Well use digits of 3, and then it says, well, okay, to get to 7, you're taking 2 times 3 plus 1 times 3 to the 0. Now, we're not here to do very basic arithmetic, but just one last thing, for instance, if you want to compute 
uh, 23 mod 19. The fastest way is to just type 23 and then the percent sign. That's not giving you a percentage, it gives you the mod that's like in C programming. So if you want to ask what is the leftover of 23 when you divide by 19, well, this will give you 4. Now, this 4 is just the integer 4, so it will carry around no knowledge of that it was reduced modulo 23. You can also uh, construct the ring of integers modulo 19, so let's call this R, which is um, Z mod of 19. So that now this thing knows it's the ring of integers. So if I'm asking it what R is, then R says, I'm the ring of integers mod 19. If I now say, well, I want actually 23 as an element of R, then I say R of 23. Now, 23 is not one of your normal integers mod 19, so I expect it to tell me, oh, 23 is actually the same as 4, because 23 mod 19 is 4. And so it will tell me that's 4. So if you want to access something and want to tell Sage, oh, please automatically reduce mod 19 or mod 18 or whatever, you create an object which is a Z mod object and then it will carry with it that it's a reduction mod 19 object. Now, I might actually want to work and with integers mod 19 and know that it's a field because 19 is prime. So then I might want to type F and no, it's not finite field. Um, it's called a Galois field um, in memory of Everis Galois. So GF of 19 gives you the Galois field or the finite field with 19 elements. And if I now ask it what is F, then instead of the previous round where it says it's the ring of integers mod 19, it tells me to find field of size 19. So when it's in the field, it knows that all the elements have an inverse there except for zero. Okay, so if I now type um, f of 23, oh yeah, in the command line you can also do the um, arrow keys up to go to previous results. You can do tab for completion. You can, um, well, first this gives you four again. You can also, if you want to go to the last command, which started with r equals, because you remember you did this thing and you now want to change the parameter, you type r equals and then do tab, uh, sorry, and then you, uh, and then you do the up arrow. So that gets you the last command, which was using that as a start. So if you now want to have the integers, uh, not mod 19, but mod 18, well, then you got the integers mod 18. It's sometimes convenient if you're still trying to figure out things. If you're, for instance, brute force searching for a point on the curve or a multiple of a point on the curve, it's convenient to say, okay, well, I call it P last time. I'm again wanted to call it P, and now just want to have a different value there. So P equals and then up, up will give you the previous results. The more up you go, the more previous with that start. And just doing up gives you the history of the last things you typed. Something which I also put on the, on the sheet sheet, um, if you want to use a variable, say, do you want to compute an elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed plus what have you not, you have to tell it that this is a polynomial variable. x is a little bit of an exception. It accepts x as a variable, but then it thinks it's over the rational numbers. So since we are typically over a fine field, we have to tell it that we want x as a polynomial variable. So we can say, actually, and now we're going to be, um, what's going to be my polynomial variable, so p, and I want to call the polynomial variable x. It will pick something, um, has an in, uh, internal notion of what the variable is. But if you want to call it x and use it, then this is the right way. And then I want to have this over r, this ring of integers mod 18 that I just defined. And then there are two ways to do it. The easiest way is just to say r, r this. And if I now ask it what is p, it will tell me it's a polynomial ring in x of the integers mod 18. I could also have typed um, much longer, but a little bit more uh, intuitive, namely polynomial doop, 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 ring, and then as an argument where I wanted to live. And then again saying what is p, it's again the 
polynomial ring in x over the integer small 80. Univariate just means it's only one variable. If I now change this to uh, having two variables here, or let's go crazy, let's do three variables, x, y, and z, and then I asked it, what is p? It will say, well, let's see, multivariate polynomial ring in the variables x, y, z. So if you're doing a long calculation, then you've totally forgotten, what was the last time you used k? Well, you haven't seen me using k, but actually in preparing this thing, I used k. Uh, oh, there was a fine field of size 7, so it's kind of convenient to have also that for your information. Hmm. Now we want to get to elliptic curves. We want to call our elliptic curve E. And, well, you have already noticed with the polynomial ring that Sage, uh, that Sage or Python is using uh, camel casing so that you spell each new word with uppercase letter. That is true for most new functions. There are some which are spelled as underscore, and then you can figure out that they come from <laughs> some other universe. So, well, Sage is importing a lot of other programs. Anyway, if you want an elliptic curve, well, let's assume it's something like L... What do we have? Ellipsis. Well, not quite. Then we have elliptic curve. And that's actually the one I'm going to show you. Um, we can also work with the next one, elliptic curve from C4, C6. Remember that we've been dealing with the short Weierstrass form. So that was the y squared equals x cubed plus C4x plus C6. Um, Elliptic curve from cubic. Well, I'm going to show you that one just as an example of it's not what you think it means. You can't just put your polynomial in x there. You actually have to give it a polynomial in x, y, and z, which is homogeneous. Well, whatever that means. So um, there are lots of things, and if you stay on to study, then all of these will make sense. Today, I'm going to show you what is the elliptic curve. Um, if I type elliptic curve, 1 comma 2, then it will define an elliptic curve. Oops, sorry. Um, it wants a uh, list here. I'm no, getting ahead of myself. So it wants a list of two elements. Well, it also shows you what nice error messages gives you, and it tells you this is not how you construct elliptic curves. Um, how you actually construct elliptic curves is this way, and now show you elliptic curve E. I haven't specified what the 1 and 2 live in. And as I said before, it will assume some reasonable place. Normally I would assume the integers, but elliptic curves like living over a field. And so actually it assumes it's over Q. Now if I hadn't remembered that I want to put these brackets around, I could have asked it, hey, how do you define elliptic curve? And that you do by putting a question mark and then you type the command you want to know about, well, which was elliptic curve for us. And don't forget, forget that you have to put empty parentheses. And now it will think a moment and then output more than you can possibly stomach. So it will tell you what this is like. It gives you a whole full screen of, so what is the type, where does it come from? Ah, and then it explains a little bit of how it's constructed. And this is actually nice. I mean, Sage people have put in a lot of effort of doing this. And this is one of the examples where not showing the full width of the screen is a little bit sad. But we are already here and have gotten to the point uh, of using this construction. Let me actually highlight it a little bit. Um, this construction, which is using the two curve coefficients for the short wire transform. And yes, it has the brackets around. We also have a curve construction, this is even more common, to put the long Weierstrass form. And you can scan through this, scan through this, this is screen full of stuff. Um, the other thing I want to show you is, well, <laughs> I actually wanted elliptic curves over a fine field, I didn't want the field um, elliptic curve over the rationals. And you can do this by putting an argument here. So I will put there my fine field of 19 elements. I hopefully remember that was called F. And then if I'm doing the same as I just did, so I type Q to get out of this helping thing, and I now realize, oops, this elliptic curve that I had, I actually wanted to be defined over the fine field mod 90. And wait, I called this F mod R. Now if I ask what is E, now it tells me it's elliptic curve over a fine field of ooh, uh, size 19. Okay, so I now can ask it all kinds about the elliptic curves. So I can ask, for instance, what points do you know? 
and yep I want to get this thing and now it tells me here's a list of all the points and maybe I want to do something with this so maybe I want to save this in some set or in a list let's call this L which is oops <laughs> The previous command that I typed was not this thing. I wanted to type uh, e dot points. Well, it can also go wrong if you're doing the um, remembering what you last typed. So I now have my L defined, and now I want to know how many points do we have. So I can ask it for the length of L. So this is now a command of L. So it's not L dot length, but it's the length of L. And it will tell us that there are 12 points. You could also have gotten this just by asking uh, what is the size of E. Now you have to remember how do you ask for a size of a math object and it could be the order or it could be the cardinality. So cardinality here um, does give you the right number. Um, also if you just looked you can see some examples. So asking for the cardinality of an elliptic curve well, actually requires point counting or exercise search. There's also something which you now actually re recognize in the baby step giant step algorithm. So this is something where, well, you're basically just computing the discrete log of one. You're asking for some generator. To what power do you have to take it in order to figure out, uh, to get to one, to point infinity. And so it can do this with the baby step giant step. However, that takes square root of the group order, so it's a very slow algorithm. You actually want to use point counting for this. And so well, using a better algorithm is, is good here. So cardinality would be 12. Okay, now we want a point. So up here we have a whole lot of points. So for instance, I want to grab the 117 point. Now how can I give come on, P being this point? We had already discussed how to make elements of fields and well, elements of elliptic curves works the same way. So E of something will give us a point. And then I can either type this in this 1, 17. So just the affine part of this point. So you see that all but the well, the first one is the point infinity. So it has a zero in the second in this third argument. But all the other points have a one in this last argument. So 1, 17. If I say, give me this point, then Sage internally will again represent this as a projective point, but it doesn't require me to put this in. If I want to get the point in infinity, say so call it infinity, then I can either type zero, uh, sorry, I can type e of zero comma one comma zero. That's the projective coordinates of the points, and then I ask it what is infinity. And it gives me this point. Or, um, and that is where Sage is a little bit too nice in my mind, but okay, it, it knows what you mean. What you mean, well, the zero element of a group, so the neutral element, so if you ask it, hey, what is the zero on this curve, it will tell you, well, infinity is now this thing. So by just typing E of zero, you get the neutral element of it. But okay, we want to have something about p and I want to show you scalar multiplication. So for instance I can ask it to do 2p and it computes a point. Now we have seen Weierstrass curves. We know that if the y coordinate is 0 then it's going to have uh, order 2. So we already know that the order of p is just 4 not 12. But I also want to show you for instance how we write a loop. Now, again, it's based in Python, so whatever you know about loops in Python, um, you can use here. If you have never programmed Python, it is very intuitive. So if you want to run through everything um, I mean, for something, so if, okay, if you know what a for loop is, then a for loop in Python is just for i in, and now you want to have a set, something you can iterate over. And I just want to have the integers less than 13. So integers from 0 till 12. And that I can get by typing, oops, that was probably not useful that I typed uh, tab here, just range of 13. So range of between two numbers, I have range this and this. It starts with the first number, 
it ends one before the last number. So range 13 will run through all the numbers less than 13, starting with zero. So if you don't have the first argument, it's assumed zero and gets me those numbers. Um, one thing to remember for the syntax, you put a colon. And then any Python interpreter, and so also Sage, uh, once you put the colon with the for loop, it will in indent this for you. So I now press return. And the next line you can see, if I move my mouse here, the cursor is blinking at a different position. So indentation is important for Sage to know that this command continues. Okay, I just want to show you all the multiples of p. So I want to type i times p. And now the for loop is done. So to press return, it helpfully indents again. Now to escape from this, I press return one more time. And then it actually gets executed. And here are the 12 points. Well, as I said, it's zero based. So here we have zero times p. Here we have one times p, which is p itself. Here's a two times p, which we had just computed anyway. Then we have three times p. We have four times p, which I already said, well, this is a point of order four. So, I mean, it has two times p has uh, y coordinate zero. So we're going to get uh, one there, uh, infinity there. So one, zero, one. And then it just repeats and repeats again. Now, you can just pick a random point. So you can just say, well, give me a random point or give me all the points. I pick one randomly. Or you can a little bit cheat because uh, Sage also has a generator function. So if you want to have all the generators of E, um, remember it is either a cyclic group or a product of two cyclic groups. So E.gens will give you one point or two points. So, okay, I got unlucky in my choice of P. If I now redefine P to be the point on E, 17,12 then if I do the same for loop that I had before, and it hope, hopefully also has the whole thing in memory, as the two lines, three line object that I typed, again, I have to go to another line to execute it. Ah, now I see it running through all the points from uh, the whole range, and then um, it prints this. Now, I've only shown you positive examples at this point, except for like one minor blunder. Um, I can also define an elliptic curve, which is maybe not so useful. So let me type again E equals to get to the last time that I typed that. That was this one. Now, instead of using the Galois field of 19 elements, I type G of, of 7. So I can just specify it here. Then I'm asking for degenerating the curve. Well, same coefficients, 1 and 2. But now these coefficients live mod 7. And if I do that, oops, it reacts. Okay, there's now a screen delay. It reacts with a full screen, you briefly saw it scrolling by. Um, the interesting part is at the bottom here, namely, oh, in red, arithmetic error. The uh, invariance, and now it shows me the full uh, five tuple, uh, list of five elements for the long wire transform, define a singular curve. And remember, singular curve was the thing of the Jacobi criterion. So, well, that is not an elliptic curve. So I got unlucky uh, with this particular curve. I could now say, oh, but ooh, maybe this curve is fine. And yes, Sage doesn't complain. So if it doesn't complain, then um, it has now redefined E to be this much, much smaller curve, or this curve over a much, much smaller field, just with seven elements. And finally, um, I could also, instead of uh, defining it this way, I could have also removed this argument here and explicitly put here, oh, I want the one to be an element of f. Remember, f was my final field of order 19. I should be proper and do this for both, but Sage is generally nice. And once one number is reduced, is considered mod 19, it will also assume the other number. So now, if I ask it what is the new elliptic curve, it will take this thing, uh, and again, sorry for not showing my whole screen, it's now over F19. So, okay, this was everything I wanted to show you about Sage. 
if there are more questions, there is of course time in the wonder session to ask me or one of the TAs over and do some more well, concrete help if you're stuck somewhere. But I hope that seeing how to construct an opt curve, getting a point, well, getting the list of points, or well, I now have a new elliptic curve, so I can now ask it, what does this new elliptic curve, the one which has coefficients 1, 1, um, if I now ask it, what does this have as generators, then, well, there is one, or I can ask it for the cardinality. Then here I would have a somewhat more interesting curve, with, or more interesting, like a bigger curve, which also shows you from the, from the Hass interval, if you have a curve, mod 19 you have somewhere around 20 points well this one has slightly more and the other one had just 12 which is somewhat less okay so this is all i wanted to tell you about sage today hope it helped see you